Alright, everybody, it's time for kind of a two-part of, of how to piss everybody off when it comes to video games. We're going to be talking about things designers get wrong about the game industry and consumers get wrong. And we're going to start with the design side, because I think this is a far more interesting point. As we've said many times over, when it comes to game development and designing a title, it is very much a combination of hard and soft skills. Again, uh, as we've said, the art and science of games, as Gamma Sutra puts it. And for a lot of developers out there, it's very easy to not understand what that means when it comes to game development. And there's several different facets that we can explore. So the first thing that I want to talk about is the idea that when a game fails, it's one thing. You know, you'll hear this from a lot of first-time surround developers. Oh, it, you know, my game failed because of marketing. My game failed because uh, the fans didn't understand it. My game failed uh, because uh, IGN and Kotaku didn't give it a 9 out of 10. But when it comes to game design and making a successful game, it's never one thing. You can use a term to try and explain, again, marketing being a popular one, but there's always multiple issues that you may or may not have seen during development that can rise up, and it goes back to that topic of death by a thousand cuts. Like, let's use marketing, for instance. I say my game failed because I didn't do marketing. Well, what does that mean exactly? Did you have a website? Do you have an email? Do you have a press list? Have you, did you reach out to people? Did you just talk to your friends and family for three years of development? Did you do any concept art or trailer videos? What exactly did you do to market this game? The, another one, the fans don't understand it. Well, how did you build your tutorial? What was your trailer video about your title? Again, all these little things can come back and hurt a game, whether or not you even realize it while you're making it. Again, hindsight being 2020 doesn't help you when you just spent the last three to five years of your life working on a single game. Now, another major point has to do with the difference between being a hobbyist and a developer, and the, or being a full-fledged game designer, I should say. There are people who use the term hobbyist as kind of, you know, the mark of shame that you failed, you know, because you're just making little tiny games and you're not, you know, living off of that. And I don't really believe that. While fans of mine know that I don't like the term or don't like the motto that if you just keep making games, you'll succeed, being a hobbyist and being able to work on games in your spare time or small projects is nothing to sneeze at. Again, if game design was easy, every single person could do it. And when it comes to understanding the differences between the two, it all comes down to how you want to position yourself in the game industry or making video games. Like we've said, there are plenty of developers out there who hate the idea behind marketing. That they hate the idea of having to take an idea of theirs and either dumb it down or make it more mainstream, you know, make it hip, fresh, whatever you want to call it, to try and get people to buy it. And there is a case for just making a game that you want to play. Sometimes that can turn out that other people want to play it as well, as we saw with the cases of Stardew Valley and obviously Dwarf Fortress. But at the end of the day, if you want to succeed when it comes to game design and living off of making video games, there is always so much more that goes into it. If you saw the presentation that I posted from a recorded talk I gave, that just being able to be a great artist, great programmer, or a great designer doesn't mean that your game is going to succeed. Now, taking that a step further, when it comes to continuing to make video games, this is a major point that I don't know if this is as well known as I think it is, but it's one thing that deserves to be mentioned. Game development is multifaceted. It's like kind of saying you're a craftsman or you're an engineer. There are multiple subtopics and areas underneath that that are all specialized. And when it comes to game design, it's very important to understand that because you built one game, doesn't make you master of all games. 
like we've said, what we've seen many times over in the independent scene, a developer of one genre will think that this is their sign to go big in a completely different genre, and that those skills are one-to-one -one transferable. But as we said in the first part, and as we're going to come back to in the second part of this video, it's not. Because you built a platformer doesn't mean that you are going to be able to build a roguelike or a fighting game or a strategy game or a city builder. There are elements that are indicative of each genre that are unique to them. Now, the underlying foundation of the game, the code, the art, that kind of stuff, those hard skills can be transferable. If you are intelligent enough and creative enough to build your own custom engine, I am sure you're not going to have, you know, as much trouble building your next game or the game after that and so on, at least from that point of view. Now, if we're talking about you, again, switching genres so radically, that's a different story. Now, with that said, though, there is one other major topic that I want to talk about in terms of where designers tend to not understand what it means to be a game developer. And this is where I will probably get into the most trouble with my thoughts. So before we do that, let's take a quick uh, shout out to our Patreon supporters, and we'll be right back. And now a quick shout out to our supporters over on patreon.com slash gwbicer. Alright, so here we have footage of the game Duskers, a dirty tech roguelike slash programming slash uh, horror title that was released by Misfits Attic. Now, the reason why I'm using this game as the footage example is that when you look at this title, there's a good chance that most of you watching this right now are thinking, why the hell did someone make a game like this? That, you know, this is a game that should not have done well. But, when I spoke with Tim Keenan of Misfits Act and looking at the overall success, this game did do well. Did it make billions of dollars and be Fortnite? Uh, heck no, it didn't do that. But it succeeded in what it set out to do. And there's two big points I want to talk about as elements, again, that game developers tend to either ignore or don't understand when it comes to game design. The first one is that at the end of the day, there is still no such thing as a guaranteed success. There is so much that goes into a game being successful. And when we say successful, we're not talking about a game that you like. We're talking about a game that breaks even, let alone actually can make a profit on. And I know with that sentence, a few of you watching this right now are probably chuckling to yourselves whenever we talk about games succeeding like that. But the point is, sometimes a great game comes out and nobody plays it. Just as a game that is horrible or is just not that well designed can still succeed on a great front. There are probably a lot of people who are salty about the success Goat Simulator had and how they were more than happy to say this game is buggy and we're intentionally leaving bugs in it and people bought essentially for the memes. But it's unfortunately a sad truth about the game industry and about being successful that this can happen and you never know really what games are going to succeed. However, with that said, the other point is that sometimes no matter even your best intentions, you are going to make a bad game. And there are unfortunately developers out there who choose to ignore that who think that it's not my fault this game did well, or even if they understood why a game didn't succeed, that people will still see it as, oh, you did your best and that's all that matters. And unfortunately, that is a very bad attitude to have when it comes to growing. And an example I want to talk about is Where the Water Tastes Like Wine that came out last year. This was a game that was a critical, well-received title. Journalists and other independent developers love this game, but it commercially flopped. And I'm putting that mildly, that most consumers did not care for this game. And we did a critical thought, we did a live show looking at the game's post-mortem that was put up, and there was one point on that that 
basically warning lights went up in my head like a fireworks display on the 4th of July. And that was the developer saying that, in hindsight, maybe they should have done more playtesting. And that, to me, is just a very uh, damning point about why that game didn't do well in the consumer's eyes. And what I want to talk about, or the point that this all leads up to, is the fact that when it comes to game design, you have to be willing to do to put in the work when it comes to understanding what goes what or what works and what doesn't work when it comes to game development and many or i see this a lot on twitter when independent developers talk about games that were just mild successes or didn't light things up and they'll chalk it up to again consumers not understanding the game that you know it's not their fault the game didn't work i made the best game i could but they're willingly or just not understanding why people didn't like this game in the first place. And sometimes, even if you put or you have the best intentions, you are still going to make a bad game. And it's not something a lot of people like to hear. Nobody wants to hear from someone saying, hey, this thing you just worked on for three to five years of your life, it sucks. It's a bad product. Go make something else. People, again, will tune out negative feedback. But as when we talked with John Breger about this when it came to playtesting, you have to take both good and bad feedback when it comes to your games. And a lot of developers, especially first-timers, will not look at the bigger picture when it comes to a game's success or failure. And the example I always go back to is The Darkest Dungeon by Red Hulk Games. A lot of developers will look at that game and only see the tremendous success that it had. That these developers, they made a great game, it got mentioned by YouTubers and major reviewers picked it up, it's on Switch and PS4 and Xbox One, developers got lucky, it's a massive success, and why can't I make a game just like it? However, as we all know, there's a lot more to the Darkest Dungeon success than what you will see. For a lot of people, we saw the game go through early access, developers doing extensive playtesting to try and make the title that was their vision while still making something that is appealing to the market. But we can even go further back than that. We can look at what they did with the Kickstarter and having appealing goals and researching the market and making a well-received campaign. But we can even go further back than that and look at the year and the year and a half they spent before then building up a fan base, releasing trailer art and concept footage and all that other stuff to make sure that people knew who they were. To give you a case in point, I didn't hear about Darkest Dungeon until the Kickstarter and the only reason I knew about that Kickstarter was because a friend of mine who posted on the same uh, forums as I did, that I did made a thread about this game. And that was only because they knew about the game from following the developers for the last year and a half. So it's one of those cases where this is where things get very frustrating to talk about. And as we said in the first part, that there is more to a successful game than you might realize. And the developers who do succeed and continue to succeed are the ones who understand it all that understand that just making a game for myself and my friends is not going to be that successful. But likewise, understanding that I have to do playtesting, that I have to reach out to more than just a small circle of people, that maybe making a game or understanding why other platformers were successful should go into the platformer I'm working on. And I cannot say this enough, but I have ran to so many cases of developers who fail at the foundational level when it comes to their game, when they don't understand UI design and playability. And this is where things get very tough to talk about, because as we've said, good game design is as much an art as it is a science. And you have to understand both if you want to make a successful game. Too many developers will focus entirely on the artistic side and not understand the structural foundation that goes into making these games. 
when we talk about UI standards when it comes to platformers or first-person shooters or strategy games or whatever the case may be, that's not us limiting your creative expression or your freedom to design. That's us telling you that there is a blueprint that the consumer expects. What we say when we use the automobile analogy, that when we say that the steering wheel should be on a specific side of the car, whether you're in the United States or in Europe, or that your car should have brake pedals and a gas or a gas pedal, that's not limiting. That's us saying that this is what the consumer expects. And there are plenty of areas when it comes to game design that you can think outside the box of and go in your own direction, but there are areas where you shouldn't do that. And if you try to push things too far like that, you're going to end up making a game that is not going to be well received. And going back to the first part of this video, this is where that death by a thousand cuts start to come into play. That when people say your game doesn't control well, that can go lead back to UI design issues, which can lead back to playtesting issues, which can lead back to how you budget what aspects of your game to focus on. And these are all issues that they grow on each other. Like when we've talked about when game design or game development schedules balloon out of control. It's never just one thing. It's not somebody just saying, I want to spend going from two years of my time on this game, I want to make that just ten years. Nobody just says that. But it, it can spiral out of control, and you may not even realize that it's happening like that. And to begin to wrap things up, for someone like me, I have played at this point over 2,000 video games, and I probably own more than that. I have seen amazing text, uh, textbook examples of great game design come from titles that only took maybe a year to two years of development. But conversely, I have seen games where developers have spent three to ten years of their life working on that had basic, I'm talking, you know, like design 101 issues when it comes to their game, whether it's from a playability standpoint, from a UI standpoint, or literally from their game development or their core gameplay loop. And in today's market, you have to realize that consumers expect a certain level of standard or quality when it comes to your game. And even if you are the most passionate person, even if you are trying to make the most artistic product that you can imagine, if you can't even get the basic foundation of that design right, then nobody is going to give you the time of day outside of your most hardened fans. And unfortunately, building a game specifically for a niche audience and spending three to five years of your life is not how you make a successful game or make a successful company. And like we said, you can certainly do things from a hobbyist point of view, but if you want to be successful, or at least try to stack the deck in your favor, you have to understand what makes a game successful. And if you can't do that, it doesn't matter how emotional of a story you try to make, it doesn't matter how much passion you have, sometimes you're just going to end up making a bad game. And if you can't learn from that, or you choose to ignore why things don't come out right, then you will just not be successful in this industry, or at least in this market today. But with that, uh, I guess, Debbie of a downer ending, we're going to wrap up this video here. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to suggest a topic, hopefully one that's a little happier for me to cover in the future, let me know in the comments below. We have our Discord and Patreon link down there below. And if you'd like to get mentioned in my second book, you have until the end of February to do the donation there, and there'll be more information on the Patreon. But with that said, like I, like I just said, thank you so much for watching this uh, depressing or sour note video. We'll be back real soon with part two. That will probably piss off more people, and hopefully we'll have some happier topics in the future. But until then, take care. If you're looking for another book about game design, be sure to check out my first title, 20 Essential Games to Study, out now. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoy things, be sure to do all the liking and subscribing that the kids are doing these days. Check out our Discord channel link down below where we hang out and chat game design, and come back later tonight for our regular streamings. 
But that's it. And tune in for more great content here and on Game Wisdom, where we examine the art and science of games.